to welcome to Jackie's Larry Corner. I am Jackie. As you can see, I couldn't resist another trip to Givens Bookstore. I wanted, I, yesterday of course was Sunday, so yes it was technically open, but it was open only for a few hours. And then the other bookstore, um, the country bookshop, the independent bookstore that is near where my dad goes to his writing group. He asked me if I wanted to go to Faro. Well, I'll go get out of the house and maybe I might be able to go to the country bookshop. Well, hey, what? Well, I guess they decided to cl they close on Sundays, which so um, that was a little disappointing. But I would only probably have a couple hours there anyway. Um, so I was like, you know what? Today I am still off and I have to go back to work the next tomorrow, starting tomorrow for the next two days. So I figured, let me just go. The only problem now is because, of course. I'm trying to stick to a budget every month, and I am off four days in a row coming up, and I don't have a lot of hobbies, so it's like, if I want to get out of the house then and do something, then I'm going to go to the bookstore. Although, um, like you guys know, I have started trying diamond painting, which the problem, the only thing of that is I'm sit, I'm still sitting the whole time. And I do get frustrated because if there's a little spot in the middle that I miss and I'm trying to put the little the little bead down, I can't get it there. So so yeah, it's a it's still a hobby that requires me to sit down and sit down I'm sitting down for hours and sometimes I'm hunched over, so that cannot be good for my posture. But um it's still something to do other than going to the bookstore all the time. So, I mean, I can still go. I'm, I'm okay budget-wise mostly, but, you know, I will probably, I always am getting, like, the amount of books that I've got this time around. So, I'll see what happens. I might watch, I might be watching a lot of movies and stuff those four days. I mean, who knows? Maybe we'll go out to eat for breakfast or something or, like, dinner, you know, those during those four days. But anyway, um... So, let's talk about what I got. First, okay, I got this non-fiction book here. Um, there was three non-fictions I was thinking about, and I decided to get to this one, because this is probably one of the few places I might be able to get this book. Like, I don't know if I would see this at Books I mean, maybe I would. Maybe I would see a nice copy at Books A Million. But, I don't know if I would want to spend full price on this. Um, so, actually, that's what I should say. I don't, this is, this is a place to get this book without spending full price on it. I mean, I probably, and it would be hard, and I know this is thrift books that I use and everything, but it's like, sometimes, some of these books, it's hard to get them because there's no, they might not always be there. I mean, granted, I don't know how popular this particular book I'm going to show you is, and then I don't know. It might be at Black Castle. It could potentially be there too, so that would be the next best place to check, um, to see if it's there. But then, as Steve Donahue says about the book brattle, when it comes to used book shopping, I mean brattle books. Okay, rewind that. As Steve Donahue says, when it comes to the brattle in Boston, which is an used bookstore that he goes to all the time. And really, a really big one. I want if I ever get a chance to go to Boston because I think that would be a really fun little, little vacation, a little bit cheaper, to do a vacation because you know we're a little bit closer to Boston than, you know, than going to England or something. And as he always says that, yes, the Brattle provides, but there's no guarantee that the if you go in there looking for a particular book. You're not going to find it. There's no guarantee you're going to find it. So I feel like it's the same thing. Um, there's no guarantee that... I feel like it's the same thing. I might use bookstores where there's no guarantee you're going to find if you're going in there with a specific book in mind. Because and even if you saw it there once and you're like, oh, I should have bought it and then decide, well, if it's still there, I'm going to buy it. It might not be there. Now, there were... there Actually, one of the books I bought today, it's one that I kept seeing there. Not that at the time I was like thinking, I mean, well, yeah, I was a little bit, but it was one I was uncertain about. Um, but anyway, I will show you. So I think that's the key. That's the thing you got to remember when you go to used bookstores is that don't go in there, go into those used bookstores thinking you're going to find a particular book. 
you might find it because there's a lot of there might be a lot of books there especially the bigger books the bigger used bookstores there is a tiny tiny chance you might find it but most likely if you're gonna use just don't go there with specifics in mind go there you know um but anyway so let's get to the book itself here it is the threat the Fedoris papers and i'm glad that it's not a mass market um this is the essays that on where they were explaining and trying to defend the u.s constitution when um you had as the title says at the top as the title i can't remember what these are what this is called the the title card says these were essays that were written by james madison hamilton and john jay and if you've seen the play Hamilton which inspired this purchase then it says some of the lyrics when Aaron Burr is narrating about this part of history he said that James Madison wrote 29 essays John Jay wrote 20 um wrote five six or I think John Jay wrote five and he got sick though and then Hamilton wrote the other 51. Um, sorry, that's my terrible impression of Aaron, of Aaron Burr played by, um, what is his name? The actor, he was, he played, he had a role in one of the Supernatural episodes. I cannot remember his name. And I think he's done some, a lot of other stuff lately. But I, I cannot remember, I can't even, um, what is his name? The guy who plays Aaron Burr in the original Broadway cast, I can't think of his name. It's gonna, when I'm halfway through this filming, I'm gonna remember. Or when I'm done filming, I'll remember. But anyway, the guy I'm playing Aaron, I was trying to do an impression of the guy playing Aaron Burr. Um, but like I said, this is them def writing essays defending the U.S. Constitution. And I was debating about this, getting this, but you know what? I figured this would be a great opportunity. And I've always been interested in um, American history, uh, which, you know, I'm American, so, um, and just history in general. And I've always, you know, since seeing the play, the stage play Hamilton, I've always been, like, especially fascinated with the Re American Revolution. You know, and I even, you know, I listened to the, um, to the Hamilton biography written by Ron Chernow on audiobook. I think I, ha I think it's one of, it's the one that I bought because it's so long. So I was not going to get it off of Libby. Um, so yeah, I have it. So we could technically listen to it and, um, you know, my parents wanted to listen to it in the car, which they probably wouldn't want to because it would probably be boring for them because I mean, Ron, Ch you know, the narrator is not necessarily he doesn't have like a special unique voice or anything like that but i mean this, he's still a good um a good narrator well spoken very clear and enunciates and all that which you gotta be but like it's not i mean but he and he's also just reading a non a biography on this person so he doesn't need to be too creative with that you know he doesn't like absolutely have to be too creative um and you know it might they might find it boring it might Dad would might find it interesting. My mom might be bored by it. I think she prefer she would prefer listening to talk radio, or listening to Nick Vile, who you know one of the Bachelors. Who he has his own podcast, so he talks about the show now with two other um, co-hosts, and his um, his fiance is on there too sometimes. Do it, like she does the she's the pop culture correspondent I think. Um, and yes, I admit sometimes I listen to it. Like, it's kind of, as I tell my mom, it's kind of hard not to. You know, it's like, I very much a love-hate relationship with reality TV. <laughs> but anyway, so, um, let me actually see what the back says. Okay, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison organized the Constitutional Congress that ended a decade of turmoil based on the urgent need for power sharing between state and federal authorities the Constitution included here as an appendix. Oh, oh my god, that's so cool! Oh my god, so they, you have the Constitution in here! 
Oh, that is so cool. Um, has proved resilient enough to survive almost unchanged for 200 years. Hamilton and Madison with John Jay persuaded voters to ratify the Constitution with their magnificent series of Federalist Papers, which were claimed by George Washington, Professor Camerick, Cramerick, detailed introduction. Oh, let me let me do that again. Um, learns to ratify the Constitution with their magnificent series of Federalist Papers, which were claimed by George Washington. Professor Cramerick detailed Cramerick's detailed introduction brilliantly sets the papers in the historical and political context. That is so cool. That is really that is really cool. Um, that it actually has the Constitution in here. But, um, but, anyway, I have very mixed, rela I love history, but then I have a very mixed re relationship with this, because I would be worried that it would bore me, even though I like learning about history. Sometimes it's more interesting to talk to someone about history, and, um, one-on-one -on -one because lectures i mean grin if i'm not tired and it's not early in the morning or if it's morning but i have i didn't have to get up early like i did when i took my art history class then i'm good i i don't mind listening to a lecture but um i like i love hamilton and i think because they told it in a fun relatable way they told the story um and the audiobook was good and i could listen to it when i wanted to so that, I think, I feel like that really helps. But I have this and I'm going to read it. I'm going to try and read it. And there won't be any rush to read it all the way through. Just read different essays throughout. But I cannot believe they wrote, I think there are 85. Or at least that's what the lyrics in the, um, in the song. I think it's in the song, um, uh, what, it's my favorite one in the whole musical. Um, I cannot remember what the song is called. It's, um, it's kind of the middle song where they're talking about, where Aaron Burr is kind of talking about what Hamilton's been doing and how he's doing, he never, never stops, never takes a break. He's always doing, he always has to do something. He's, why, why are you, something like. Sorry, I'm trying to think of the name of it because it's my favorite song, so I feel like I should know the title of the song. Um, why are you running out of time? Or why are you... Or, like, you need to survive. I, it's gonna... I'm gonna remember. It's gonna pop my... I mean, I could run and get my iPod because I have the soundtrack on my iPod. But I don't... Or look on the internet in which I, but then I don't, again, I don't know what happens when I leave the screen, the video screen, and accidentally, like, to call up something and have to s s make it smaller. I don't, I don't know what you guys see when I do that, so I don't want to, I don't want to do that either. But it's, like, you, I like your, you work like you're right now, time, or something like that, that, you know, that... That, it's, like I said, I think it's a song in the middle of the, you know, between the two acts. Like, maybe when you get right back to act two, when you start on act two, whatever. Um, which, I should really watch that musical. I should start, like, a history-themed reading month and re and w starting with the, watching that musical. <laughs> and watching 1776. You should do that. Because that's also a fun musical, too. I mean, it's not, like, maybe today's audience might not appreciate that. That musical, I mean, I think if you're a musical buff, you might appreciate it a little bit more. But 1776 is another great musical about the American Revolution. Um, but it's about the Continental Congress, the um, Continental Congress creating the Constitution that was written by Thomas Jefferson. And it's them, um, trying to, like, debating, and John Adams is, you know, like, trying to get it out there. And, you know, you have people like Dickinson who are like, no, why do we, why, are like, why do we need to leave England? We don't need to escape England. And they, we sh he's our king and we should be loyal to him. And that's basically to buy people that see king, the king as a tyrant. And then you have the people 
mostly a lot of mostly the South who are like who see the king as some they need to respect him and he's our king and we need to be loyal to him and what if we don't win this war we will be hung for treason which yeah I mean if they didn't win I mean but anyway so yeah so yeah I feel like I should do I feel like I should do a reading month of history American Revolution specifically specifically but anyway so the other the other um classic because that's considered a classic I think that I got was Pilgrim's Progress by Paul Bunyan and I did look it up on Goodreads the first time I thought about getting it this was the book that I kept going back and forth and I kept seeing it there and then um every time I would go back I was like I'm thinking about should I get it or not and actually, I think this will be a great read to pair with Les, Les, Miserables, Les Miserables. I think this will be a great book to pair with that because you do, particularly maybe the beginning part with Jean Valjean, where he's traveling. Like, I kept, you know, I keep thinking about the scene when I hear this title, The Pilgrim's Progress. Um, I think this is about a guy that you know, up and leaves his family and decides, or at least that's what people said on Goodreads, that's how they put that, he just ditches his family and decides to go on a, on a you know, journey of self-discovery. And he starts, and according to a little bit of an introduction I read, he is leaving his, he is, wrote this in prison, the author, I think. Um, oh, this was, this edition will be eight ninety five. In 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 Canada it would be ten ninety five. So what I really see I these not I don't like the framing of these books and how each of them are this part is a different color in each classic. But, you know I just have a soft spot for these ones and I like the paintings they use. Um, some not always but um. And you have like. Um. And they're usually really cheap editions that you when you get these so so they're not too bad they're decent looking and they're cheap <laughs> and they're a good size so i'm gonna read this back description okay so it's introduction notes by david hawks um faith hope mercy envy ignorance guilt these are not abstract concepts but the names of vividly imagined sh sharply drawn human characters Encountered by Christian. The hero. Oh, and his name is Christian. I didn't know that. Um, the hero of the Pilgrim's Progress. In John Bunyan's seventh, 17th century allegory of the soul's search for salvation, each step. Oh, allegory, of course. That's why probably why people, because it is very Christian, as in not the name, but as in the book, as an allegory. Um, I think sometimes those can, those can be tricky. You know, unless the way you the with the way they're done, you know, you don't like. Um, allegory of the soul's search for salvation. Each step along the way becomes a dramatic rendering of an inner state of the human psyche, as Christian journeys from the wilderness of this world to the glory of the celestial city. He confronts a seemingly endless array of temptations, threats. And dangers, including the nearly is, is irresistible allure of marital splendor at Vanity Fair, the crushing psychological burden of depression and despair, and the sloth of despond, and the fear and uncertainty that eats away at faith in Downing Castle. Okay, so this particular edition includes both the first and second parts of the Pilgrim's Progress, which is good. I did not know it was divided into parts. I'm glad that they're all in, they're both in here. Um, which collectively reflect the fervent intensity of Bunyan's religious beliefs. What remains significant is Bunyan's ability to transform this intensity into an allegory that speaks to people of all faiths and all eras. Okay, so let's see what it says about the, the guy who um, gave the introduction and stuff. Um, David Hawkes. He's a professor of English at Arizona University. His books include Idols of Marketplace, 2001. Ideology, second edition, 2003. And John Milton, A Hero of Our Time, 2009. Ooh, I'm going to read that once I finally finish Paradise Lost. Um, he has contributed articles to The Nation, 
Times Literary Supplement in the Journal of History of Ideas. So, I don't know if you guys, have, if you guys look at all my videos on my book hauls, especially when I they're used book hauls, you notice that I'm I feel more I'm very more experimental. Not I mean not too experimental, but I'm more willing to spend four dollars on a book like this. That's more like that's classic or more academically minded or more challenging for me or is not necessarily one of those oh let me go back not exactly a like a a fun fun read like not like a fluff read or like a you know more like academically and thought provoking read um like a fan, you know, like, like a fantasy book, like, um, a discovery of witches or something, like, it's not, you know, like, I have more, I get more of those books at the rest office, and they're only, you know, four dollars, unless it's a hardback, or no, they're only three dollars, but if it's a hardback, it's four dollars. So, I feel like I'm being, when it comes to when I get something like this, I feel like it's a little more adventurous for me. In a sense that it's more, I should say not adventurous, but more challenging for me. Because, because I don't know if I'm going to be able to get into this. Like, I don't know. It is, like, it's a risk. Because I don't know if I'm going to love this. And, you know, it might take me some time to get motivated to read this. Because I'd be very nervous about reading it. Um, and I do know from some of those re reviews, especially from female readers... There's stuff that, as a woman, I might roll my eyes at and just be like, the fact that this, according to some of these reviews, the guy supposedly ups and leaves his, his wife and kids to go looking for himself. Like, that's how some people reviewed it. So, it's one of these things where I decided to pick it up just to see how I feel about it. Because I might have a little more patience, you know, and be a little less... And just humor, you know, just be like, okay, yeah, I don't necessarily agree with that and find it silly, but it doesn't make it necessarily a bad book, at least for me, in my opinion. It just, like, I mean, I can understand how something like that could ruin, could ruin an appeal of a book because there's a lot of classics that just have very old ideas that today don't jive well with today's readers and ideas that just we feel like we need to, you know we've grown so much as society that it's that stuff like that is not as acceptable and you know we and so but this was written a long time for my for me personally this was written a long time ago and yes maybe now by today's standards it wouldn't be considered a classic but I think we, if we don't focus so much on those old concepts that aren't as acceptable today and focus on the other messages of these older books, then, you know, we might appreciate them a little bit more. We might appreciate them and be not necessarily enjoying them, but just be okay with them and be like yeah they had some ideas back then that aren't right and aren't fair and we don't necessarily understand and connect with but it's okay because it's not like because i mean things we have grown as a society as humans and realize that that kind of stuff is you know not as acceptable today and that that's what we need to that's why the past is important to realize that to show how much we've grown and to learn from the past and that includes learning from books like this that you know and it's just one and and that and you know i'm just talking about that one part you know of why he goes on this like before he goes on this quest this soul searching quest and yeah, maybe he might be an insufferable, insufferable character. He might be annoying, and but that doesn't mean he's necessarily 
a bad character. And it would be, you know, and there are people like that in real life anyway. So it will be, and I think when a characters are insufferable and sometimes for me it's, I'm just, depending on my mood, sometimes I'm very entertained by those characters anyway. Um, so, yeah. So not for about that. Let's talk about the last book I got. Um, because I got three books. The last one is The Love of Stones by Tobias Hill. Um, so this is these people, um, okay, I'm just gonna read the back. I'm gonna scan it, but you know what, I'll just read the back and say waste your time as you watch me scan the back of this. An epic story spanning two continents and six centuries, The Love of Stones follows the very, three very different people, each in their own way consumed by the desire that borders on obsession. The quest is for the three brethren, a legendary jewel that casts shadow over all that come in contact with it. So it's one of those kinds of stories where they're finding something that could be dangerous, but they don't care because they could also get a lot of money if they find it. <laughs> um, so basically like Indiana Jones. The, some of the bad guys in Indiana Jones. But I definitely have a soft spot for those kinds of stories where like people are looking for something from the past. Like um, some historical thing that could be, you know, a treasure of some kind and how it could be worth all these riches and everything. And they're trying to, but it has all this great power that could be dangerous. And, um, but yeah, it's on it's So these are the three books I got from the rest of today. So, um, um, do you, what do you think, uh, do you, have you read any of, any of those books that I mentioned? Um, did, and I'm wondering, did, like, either, like, either of these books that you ever have to read, either of these in college or, you know, in school, like, whether in college or high school, did you have to, did either you have, any of you have to read these books? Um, I think that would be, um, I don't know if I would want to tell, would want you to tell me what you think of them because then I don't want to be influenced by your, by your guys' opinion. Not that I don't appreciate your opinion. It's just, I want to read them. I don't want, I already feel like I'm influenced by booktubers as it is. And I want to re decide to read these, at least attempt to read these before I change my mind in the future and decide I'm not going to read them and I wasted my money. So, but, but I would love to, like I said though, I wanted, I would want to know if you were, did you have to read either one of these, um, for school? I'd be curious because I didn't have to read any of these. In fact, interesting, interesting thing. So apparently my second, my nephew who's in second grade is doing like he did a, he play, he did a um, presentation in his class where he dressed up as Thomas Paine and talked to and did kind of presented facts about Thomas Paine and everything and even did a cute little English accent which I was so I was so proud of my little boy that looked that kid that little kid um and I just found out they, they're gonna do Shakespeare next so I thought that was so cool especially he's in second grade so that's impressive they're that they're teaching second graders this stuff because I don't remember learning this stuff in elementary school. I don't know what I learned in elementary school. I just remember, you know, when we would... I barely remember elementary school. I just remember a loving recess. I remember doing group, getting sitting in a group. You know, our tables were put together. And I remember doing one of our English-related assignments was we each... The different table sections where we each given a book to read. Or we, like, or we could pick which book we wanted to... Actually, no, I think we were assigned the book. And then I remember doing Old Yeller that time. Um, and then I remember, like, going to this classic book fair coming and everything. I remember one time we did a project where we were, we did a fake, you know, a pretend trip to Mexico. And we, you know, we had to plan it and everything, which was really fun. And we did a, a, we pretend to, you know, do, assimilate a flight, flying in a plane and everything. And just the way, and... But I don't remember what we his what we learned and when it came to social studies what we did. 
but which I don't know why they call social studies. I mean, I guess because it's history, so society and everything, but I don't know why they just didn't call it history. But anyway, um, I didn't, I didn't remember learning starting on history until like middle school, middle school, high school. So it surprised me that in second grade they're starting history type stuff. You know, because Shakespeare's in English and history, I feel like. Um, but yeah, so. And that, it should be great. And that might motivate me to the next time we go. I mean, he might be done with Shakespeare by the time we go, but by the time my mom and I, and possibly my dad, go to visit my sister. But maybe I'll be bringing one of my my Shakespeare play, my latest Shakespeare play that I bought, um, A Winter's Tale. The, the Winter's Tale, not A Winter's Tale, The Winter's Tale. The Winter's Tale. So, um, but yeah, I thought that would, I was very proud, a mixture of surprise and proud what he's learning in, in second grade. But anyway, um, if you guys like this video, be sure to click a thumbs up, click subscribe, click the bell icon below if you, if you want to be notified about my latest videos. Um, and I hope you are enjoying your reading. And, um, have you gone book shopping lately? Please let me know what books you recently purchased if you have, or have you visited your library lately? I am apprehensive about going to my library because I have so many of my own books that I need to read, and I always feel guilty because I prioritize my library books so I can return them as soon as, I, as possible, and I don't have to keep renewing them, so I don't ever get longer books from the library. But then... I have so many of my own books that I need to get to, so I'm like, I have to, like, I keep thinking, okay, I'm going to finally go back, and then I'm like, I don't know, because I have all my other books to read, so I don't know, but I am in the middle, I am almost done with the book right now, and thankfully it is one of the books that I got from, that I thrifted, one of the books, I think it actually is from the said bookstore, Givens, so that will be good, at least I got that, I got that done. Well, I don't know. Anyway, I will talk to y'all later. Bye!